You may recognize the moderator for our second panel from TV. Faye D'Souza is a senior t t television journalist and a news anchor for Mirror Now. Her reporting focuses on issues that matter to citizens of India on taxation, education, health, and urban development. Please join me in welcoming Faye D'Souza. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, you know, very, very happy to have been invited. And, um, extremely intimidated by everyone else on the panel here, so I'm going to speak as little as possible so as not to expose myself. <laughs> uh, India is, is a country of massive and very, very interesting problems. 67% of our population is engaged in the process of growing food, and somehow still we have the largest population of hungry people in the world. We, uh, our healthcare industry, private healthcare industry, is expected to grow to $300 billion by 2022. But we have the largest population of people who don't have access to basic primary healthcare, basic primary healthcare. We're among the lowest spenders of healthcare as a government in the world, spending only about 1.5% of our total GDP. Our economic crisis right now, while we're a very ambitious country, is punctuated by terrible job loss. Air pollution, I don't need to tell you about it. You got here this morning, so some of it is in your lungs already. <coughs> Climate change, as was being talked about yesterday, Indians as a race will be among the worst affected by floods and water issues and polluted rivers and other impacts of climate change. So we are perhaps in most need of research-based innovation than anywhere else in the world. And to be able to marry research-based innovation and findings with things on the ground, solutions, passing on that information, creating products that we can implement and actually change people's lives is perhaps the biggest challenge that India is facing. More so now than ever before, because we're also uh, quite unfortunately at a point where a Nobel laureate of economics got dismissed by a union minister for having ideas that are too what he called left wing. We're also at a point where our <coughs> prime minister very famously said he prefers hard work to Harvard. So we are bringing in. What did you say about the ocean? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing so far. <laughs> well, well, one of your alumni who headed our RBI has received quite a mouthful, but we won't go there. <laughs> well, it is a challenge. It's always been a challenge. It's perhaps more pronounced now than it has ever been before. <coughs> um, also, as a country, we tend to focus on things that make for good uh, journalism and good PR rather than things that actually will solve problems on the ground. So these are the things that I want to put forward to our panel before we start discussing is the challenges that India has that can perhaps be fixed with, um, with research-based innovation and solutions. And also because we have the largest population right now that can be used to test these ideas. Like I said, we have an amazing panel, so I'm just going to get straight to it so they can each share their ideas with you. Uh, Professor Michael Greenstone is uh, a director, is, is with the University of Chicago, director of the Becker Friedman Institute of Economics, director of Energy Policy Institute, uh, Institute at the University of Chicago, director at the Stata Center for Development at the University of Chicago. His research is focused on testing innovative ways to increase energy access but improve efficiency. And he's also served as the chief economist for President Obama's Council for Economic Advisors. But he's specifically going to talk about how to uh, incentivize people to innovate on air quality and improve air quality specifically in India. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Nishant Agarwal. You know, when children say they want to grow up and be superheroes, they're referring to becoming Dr. Nishant Agarwal. <laughs> uh, he's perhaps the closest we'll get to growing up and saving the world. His research uh, has actually is, is, you know, it's going to save countless lives, not just in the West, but also in countries like India, where we'll perhaps be able to uh, detect cancer earlier and thereby actually save people's lives. It's a very tangible thing to introduce, so I'm very happy to do that. Uh, Dr. Sudhir Nair is the head uh, and neck surgeon and from the Tata Memorial Center at Mumbai. It's uh, among the largest centers for cancer in the country. And the doctors, anyone who's been inside, and I live in Mumbai, anyone who's been inside the Tata Memorial Center will tell you that the work that the doctors do 
is selfless and saintly because everyone from across the country, this large country, goes to that one hospital for help. And these doctors work day in and day out trying to save people's lives. It's the most amazing thing you will ever see if you have the time to go see how the work happens at uh, that hospital. So I'm really happy to meet Dr. Nair personally. Mr. A.K. Rastogi is the chairperson of the Jharkhand State Pollution Control Board. He's worked with the government for a very, very long time. And he brings in a very interesting perspective on how people inside of government can use research and insight to change lives and what they're doing in Jharkhand specifically. <coughs> Mr. Rastogi, welcome. And thank, thank you for giving us your time. Uh, but I do want to start with Mr. Ganesh Neelam. He's the head of innovations and technology at the Tata Trust. Um, Ganesh spearheads the energy-related projects and he engages with various partners. He's specifically working on changing the lives of tribal people across the four uh, you know, central states of India. And that's very, very <coughs> important work as well. Ganesh? Morning, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, to this fifth anniversary of the Tata Center. Uh, not the Tata Center, the uh, University of Chicago Center <laughs> in India. <laughs> it actually will be a Tata Center also, maybe in 10 years down the line, we'll have that. Force of habit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and thanks a lot to the University of Chicago for inviting the trust uh, to share uh, what the trust does uh, uh, in this space and the partnership that we have with the, the, the Tata, Tata Center in Delhi. Just to give a brief, uh, I don't know how many of you know about Tata Trust, uh, but we are India's oldest philanthropy. So we are 127 years old philanthropy, uh, started by our founder, Jamshed Ji Tata. And it's basically in our bloods that whatever we earn uh, as the company, uh, we basically give it back to the community. So that's been the motto of the, the trust. And uh, we basically have a dividends from the, the main parent company, Tata Sons. And we use that dividends to give it back to the community through various development programs uh, such as livelihoods, education, healthcare. So we are mostly into implementation and also work closely with the different state and the national uh, government. Uh, we basically, the trusts have been pioneers in, in promoting institutions within India. So if you name like uh, institutions like IIST, the first uh, science institution in India was again started by Jamshidji Tata. Uh, TIFR, uh, one of the most renowned institutions on fundamental research, was promoted by the trust. TISC, yesterday we had a brief about Tata Institute for Social Sciences. So that's again promoted by Tata. So you have endless institutions which the trust has been promoting for last 100, 100 odd years uh, overall. And the recent additions to these institutions have been TIGS, uh, which basically is again a partnership with the University of San Diego uh, for us to work on genetic research for uh, say issues like malaria, dengue, and other uh, <coughs> things. And uh, one more institution which we recently promoted about three years back was a foundation for innovation and social entrepreneurship. So which a senior of mine, Manoj, basically looks after it. And he's also closely associated with the University of Chicago on, on this partnership that we have. So we have been working and promoting a lot of institutions over the years. And in the last few years, we also have been working very closely on looking at some strong uh, partnerships with different universities within India, also outside India. And some of these partnerships are like the, the partnership that we have with MIT. We have a Tata Center at MIT and a similar parallel institution in IIT Bombay. Again, the focus has been to see how we can look at the technology and the research that these institutions work on and get them to uh, action. So it's not only a research, but it also gets converted into action through the trust presence uh, within India. And how do we take actions on these type of programs? The second important element of this partnership has been, it should be problem statement driven. So it's basically also understanding the challenges and issues that a country like India faces. How do we feed that back into the university system and ensure the professors and the students take up these research activities to come up with some say good solutions for the community to adopt and uh, then see how it gets scaled up. So these, uh, like we are doing it with MIT and we have a very, similar and a very strong partnership with the University of Chicago, uh, which has been underway for the last uh, two to three years. The Tata Center, uh, which we are all uh, sitting uh, here at. And this partnership basically, again, as I said, is towards 
taking the strength of University of Chicago, which is mostly on economic and social research, and how do we basically look at some issues that a country like India is facing, work together on uh, taking this research into some very strong solutions uh, that the system can adopt, institutions like Tata Trust can adopt, and see that we actually deliver it to the, to the community which needs it the most. So that's been a partnership uh, with the Tata Center for the last few years, and we hope we continue this partnership for many more years to, to come in. Uh, one of the important uh, programs that the Tata Center is uh, currently doing is on the air pollution, uh, basically on the star rating program, which we find it really exciting. And th the benefits of it could be seen that many state governments are coming ahead and asking for us to work in that program uh, closely together and see how we can uh, take it ahead. So this is just an example. And uh, with the center, we are hoping to take up some other important challenges uh, like the farmer uh, distress issues, uh, doubling farmer income, which is like a major uh, piece that the government is now pushing across uh, very strongly. So how do we work closely with the center? Because the trust also has a very uh, strong strength uh, of working on livelihoods of the rural and tribal communities, mainly the small and marginal farmers. So how do we work with the center on coming up with some real strong uh, what you call suggestions to the system as well as us to implement it on ground and enable a better life for these uh, small and marginal farmers to meet their aspirations over the years to come. So we are hoping that this partnership uh, continues on a long-term basis for us to take it ahead. And we work together on uh, taking some real problems for us to engage in and then see how it actually could be brought into action. The trust basically will be the bridge between say, the university and the system or also the CSO partners that we work very closely to ensure that the research is not only in research but also gets into action uh, very intensively. That's, that's the core focus uh, that we have. And as our mission is to work with about 100 million lives, basically positively impact these 100 million lives by 2020, we hope the center will be playing an important role on achieving that mission uh, that we have uh, within the trust and its ecosystem. So thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. And uh, thanks to the center for inviting need to speak on, on this behalf. And a warm welcome again from, uh, from the Tata Trust to all of you. And we hope we continue this partnership on a long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, I want to uh, now invite Michael, Professor Michael Greenstone to speak to us about the star rating program. It's one that has actually um, made a huge impact and has been extremely successful. It's a great example of how research and innovation can help public policy. Professor Greenstone. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here today. There we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ganesh, for those terrific words. Uh, it's wonderful to be in partnership with Tata Trust. In many respects, what the TCD, which is a creation of the Tata Trust and the University of Chicago, is an aim to solve a problem that uh, can often exist in academia, which is that ideas can get created uh, and then they can sit in journals, which I like to read, but I'm in a club of about 11 people who like to read them, uh, and th those ideas will never really <coughs> enter the real world. Uh, and uh, the, this relationship and the creation of TCD is meant to solve that very problem, obviously, uh, as it relates uh, to India in particular. And, and I'll just say, when we began on this enterprise, uh, I think we had hopes uh, that there would be lots of interest in engagement and research and impact in India from the University of Chicago faculty, but there was a little bit of a bet. Uh, and uh, it's, there's been a just unbelievable, bountiful uh, supply of Chicago faculty, including several who are here today, uh, who have found that interacting uh, and engaging and positioning their research to look at India uh, is, uh, rewarding, both in terms of being able to test new ideas, but also uh, to get those ideas out in the real world. So with that, let me just talk a little bit uh, about the star rating program, uh, which is one example. Uh, uh, and again, at this point, this might be repetitive, but the Tata Center for Development at the University of Chicago aims to uh, combine the rigor of the Chicago economics tradition uh, with the Tata Trust deep engagement and long history uh, in India to produce research uh, and impact in India. Uh, the model that we have and that we 
uh, focus on is uh, it, 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 think of it as almost like a three-step process. Uh, the first step is pose an interesting question and then do some research around that to try to answer that question. Uh, every academic wakes up every single day trying to do that, uh, and that's what the University of Chicago can bring to that. Uh, the second is that that research, as I said, often ends up in journals that I like to read and not so many other people. And so how do you translate that research uh, into something that other people can understand in the broader world? Uh, and so a big part of that is outreach, where we take and we've built uh, a really terrific top-notch team, many of them who are here today, lurking around the room somewhere, thinking about better ways I could be explaining things right now. Uh, and uh, they're really experts at taking these academic ideas and making them accessible and delivering them uh, to decision makers. Uh, and then the third part is to take those, that tra those translated ideas and convert them into action. And we're going to talk about an important example about that, and there's uh, plenty of other examples. Plus, there's Lenny, we're going to have a surprise bonus at the end of this panel. Uh, that nobody knows about, but it'll be very exciting. <laughs> okay, uh, so the specific thing I want to talk about is information transparency. So there's been an idea in environmental regulation for a long time uh, that part of the problem, uh, maybe when you look outside, is that nobody knows who's doing the polluting. Uh, and that if you would just arm the public uh, with that information, they would either apply pressure to the industry or they would apply pressure to the regulator, and in some way, un slightly unclear how exactly that would happen, uh, that, that would uh, lead to uh, reductions in emissions or compliance with whatever uh, the norms are. This idea uh, is kind of took off in the, in the United States in the 1980s, uh, like rocket fuel, and so there's uh, examples of it all over the world. This is actually only a partial. The first one was a toxic release inventory in the United States, which provided the public with, to my eye, completely incomprehensible information about emissions from individual plants. Uh, there, Canada has a program. There's a program in Africa. Ma Jun, who is really a uh, superstar in China, started a program. Uh, and then there's also a program in Australia. Now, what all of those programs have in common is that no one ever bothered to figure out if they were working. Uh, it was just great that they existed. Uh, and so what we are trying to do uh, is we started the Star Rating Program in collaboration uh, with the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board to try and take that really basic idea and see if you could, uh, if, if, if that was effective uh, at leading to greater compliance with laws. So the first thing uh, was just to compile information on all the plants of a certain category in Maharashtra, who, uh, the, what, what their pollution emissions were. Uh, then that, of course, is reported in things like uh, micrograms per cubic meter, which is not something that normal people talk about very often. Uh, and so we turned it in, and I'll show you this in a second, into industry performance ratings that are just stars, kind of like Yelp, or uh, I guess the motto. Uh, and then we distributed report cards and published the ratings on the website, all with the idea of, well, maybe this will be effective. And the, uh, the research component of this is that we did this for uh, several hundred plants. Uh, we only made the information public for half of them, randomly assigned. And then we're going to test whether or not this leads uh, to uh, reductions in pollution. Uh, this program has been uh, very successful in, uh, in terms of uh, drawing a lot of attention and uh, political excitement. Uh, the chief minister launched it in 2017. Uh, the Maharashtra Pollution Control Board distributes uh, report cards, uh, actually, and it's begun to seep into the regulatory process. They now hold meetings in uh, towns throughout Maharashtra and then make the industries come on stage and accept their report cards. Uh, the five-star industries come uh, and very gleefully accept it, and then they issue the one- and two-star ones in public, uh, which sometimes are people a little reluctant to come on stage and pick that one up, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they have to come up and do that. And then they've started to use those stars uh, to in alter the way that they regulate. Uh, so if you're five-star, uh, the chairman and I talked about this last night, this isn't jargon, but in the, 
there's regulatory relief if you get five star uh, and you face fewer inspections and things like that and the one star gets uh, greater attention. Uh, now these kind of things, it's like a, the story about the tree falling in the middle of the forest. Uh, so we were worried we were going to build this website and no one would know about it. Uh, and so a lot of effort has gone into making sure that people actually know. Uh, and so I, I actually, um, one of the, I don't have a Facebook page uh, and I don't have a Twitter <laughs> account, so I don't really know what any of this means. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a lot. Uh, and there's a map from the website which shows all the industries uh, who have ratings and then you can click on them. Or you can click on this guy, zoom up, and you would see the whole history of this plant. Uh, what their ratings are, uh, and provides exactly this information, uh, although in a much more accessible way than we believe has been done previously uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, people got so excited about this program uh, that the uh, Odisha state government has uh, uh, contacted us, and this is the scale up part, uh, and we're now wor uh, working with, uh, have launched uh, a star rating program. Uh, in Jarkand, uh, they have launched one. Uh, the chairman is here today. We're very proud to have him as a partner. They're in many respects doing something that's much more ambitious uh, than what Maharashtra is doing. Maharashtra, you get samples maybe once or twice or a couple times a year. Uh, they're going to base their stars on uh, continuous emissions monitoring. So I guess every 15 seconds or something like that, there'll be a reading out of the stack. It's, it's really uh, extraordinarily impressive what they're doing. Uh, and we're very proud to be able to work with them. Uh, this idea, as I said, has uh, taken hold. Odisha and Jarkind have launched it. We're in discussions with several other states. Uh, I would say uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, and Andhra Pradesh and uh, Telangana and uh, Kerala. Pretty advanced discussions. Uh, and we expect that this will uh, uh, expand to these other states. And there's initial interest uh, from other ones. So this is meant to be an encapsulation of idea research, uh, translation, this is meant to be translation to stars as opposed to micrograms per cubic meter, uh, and then uh, scale up. And in many respects, it's a model uh, for what we're trying to do with the TCD. Uh, and as I said, there'll be, uh, we're gonna talk about some other examples and then there'll be a special surprise bonus uh, example coming soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and with 30 seconds to spare. Ah. <laughs> um, I do want to invite uh, Dr. Nishant Agarwal to speak right now. Again, um, a brilliant example of how research can change lives and how research can actually be brought in to public policy to save human beings. Thank you, thank you, Faye. Um, your, your introduction was very much exaggerated. You don't <laughs> want to hear what my wife calls me. But I think everyone in this room is actually a superhero. Anyone who does not accept the status quo and wants to make the world better for me is a superhero. So thank you, everyone. So I'm gonna switch subjects a little bit and talk about oral cancer. Um, so there are about 600,000 cases of oral cancer worldwide. India has about a third of them, so about 200,000. Um, it is the third most common cancer in India. It's the most common cancer in men and the fifth most common cancer in women. There's a pretty significant toll. Um, treatment for oral cancer is about 500,000 rupees, um, which is much greater than the per capita annual income for most people who work in India. And people who get treated for oral cancer generally cannot afford their treatment. So they have to sell assets or borrow loans, borrow money with loans, and they don't always return to the workforce. So it is a very, very significant health and economic burden. So don't get grossed out. Um, I don't know how this is displaying, but this is a tongue, and this is a cancer, which is not supposed to be here. And this is unfortunately the stage, this is probably a stage three cancer that most patients present with. So at stage three or stage four, the prognosis for this patient would be about a 40 per, 30 to 40 percent five year survival. So pretty abysmal. And that's with full treatment, which would be a combination of surgery, radiation, and their chemotherapy. 
but unfortunately, most of our patients present at advanced stage, can advanced stage cancers. This is the ideal state. This is what we would love to see. This is a chip shot. If this patient recurs, this is my fault. If the patient in the previous picture recurs, it's maybe not my fault, just the aggressiveness of the tumor. But this is so rare that we see a lesion um, in, in an early stage, in a precancerous state, or a stage one, stage two. So as Michael alluded to, this is a journal. It's from the American Dental Association. Um, we published this. We were very happy. This was an evidence-based clinical practice guideline for the evaluation of potentially malignant disorders in the oral cavity. So all the major medical centers in the U.S. contributed with authors there. I was an author. Again, we were very proud of our work. And we published guidelines um, to show what the workflow would be if a patient has a suspicious lesion. And the problem with our guidelines, again, this is the theoretical versus practic practicality of this, it actually falls apart at the first arrow. So we did a lot of work, we published this, it was, I think, the most downloaded article, but it's not practical. So for this, in, in India, a person would need a biopsy and a, the ratio of a patient, a high-risk patient, to someone who can actually perform the biopsy and perform it and, and interpret it is one to 2,000. So the odds are against us to find an expert who could actually do this. So we can't even go further down because we can't perform a biopsy. We don't have the resources in the field. <coughs> so we went back to the building blocks. So you can criticize us for this, but this is sort of the foundation of life. So DNA gets transcribed to <coughs> RNA, which gets translated to protein. Decades of research has indicated that cancer is a genetic disease, meaning there's mutations or errors that occur in our DNA. And there are different parts of the genome. So there's the whole genome, which is about 300 billion base pairs, or the exome, which is the coding part. So that's the part that actually becomes protein. So there is about 20,000 genes in the exome um, of a human being. So there's a lot of genes that could be potentially mutated in cancer. So for our work, what we defined were a, a seven genes. So out of 20,000, we identified the seven most frequently mutated genes on oral cavity cancer. So if you look, this is an idealized version of the human genome um, right here. Um, so 23 paired chromosomes is normal. Because of mutations, you get the cancer genome. Now if you look at this closely, you would see that there are a lot of mu mutations that occur all throughout the genome. And if I give it a second to look, maybe I'll guess there's 20 mutations. If I spend a longer time, I'll probably get the right amount. But if I look at each single book each and read it 10,000 times, which is this depth of coverage, how much will I read a single word, I'm very unlikely to get, make a mistake because I will see all of these mutations. So the cancer genome is only slightly <coughs> different than our natural human genome. And so what we're really, the, the, the problem is that we're looking for very rare events sometimes as rare as one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 events that we're trying to identify. So, um, so this is our first president. Um, I was going to use Bala, but I don't think he looks good with a mustache. Um, but you can see, again, the, the challenge is finding these rare events. So I made it easier. So this is normal George Washington, normal George Washington, and here's the George Washington with a mustache. So again, the challenge is to identify very, very rare events, one in a thousand. But now we have the technology, the next generation sequencing, which you may have heard of, which allows this pretty readily. Where the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003 at a cost of a few billion dollars and took over 10 years, now we can do the same amount of work in a matter of weeks at about a thousand dollars. So this is all doable now. So what we did was we are able to find the needle in the vast majority of cases. So we developed a highly sensitive and specific assay 
to identify tumor DNA, so these mutations from, that are shed from tumors into the saliva of patients. So non-invasive, minimally invasive, and this is field ready. So all you do is rinse your mouth with salt water and then you put it in a preservative which is stable indefinitely at room temperature. So there's no freezing and the processing only occurs when the centralized lab receives the specimen. So this is pretty practical. And this is, it's a liquid biopsy essentially. So this is the, this is P53 which is the most commonly mutated genes, gene in human malignancy. Um, this is the primary tumor in A, and then this is the orovarinza. So you can see these lollipop plots, they're sort of mirror images. So we have about 90% concordance, so we don't really have to go back to the tissue. So that first algorithm where you need expert surgeon to do a biopsy and expert pathologist, now you don't need any of it. All you have to do is rinse your mouth with salt water and then send out your sample. So the health technology life cycle is a bit complicated and it's actually very hard to bring things to market. But I really want to thank the TCD for helping us make this happen. You know, every step of the way we said we want to do this and it's always, yes, yeah, sure, how can we help? And they facilitated every process of this. And, you know, so we, we are in a pretty advanced stages now. We have um, collaborations with the Dieter's group at Tata Memorial Hospital, HCG, which is an oncology hospital throughout the country, um, Manipal Dental, so Dental Medical School, and then really our backbone is Strand Biotech. So this was a company founded about 20 years ago um, and is located all throughout India and actually has everything we need, including bioinformatics, clinical research, and clinical diagnostics to bring this to market in India. So this has really been a lot of work for the last year and a half, but we've made great achievements and we really think that we can bring this to market within the next year or two. Our goal right now is still to decrease the cost. Our goal, we, we're trying to get it less than $100, which still sounds like a lot, but relatively to the cost of healthcare when you're treating an advanced stage cancer, it's pretty insignificant. Um, so we're, we're making good progress. And again, I want to thank um, the Tata Charitable Trust for making this happen because with any other funding, this would not be doable. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's time now for that special surprise that we were promised. Uh, I just want to bring in Lenny Chaudhary, uh, who's going to introduce something very interesting that uh, I understand we're debuting. Bonus. It's a bonus. bonus. <laughs> yes. We're debuting here. This. So it's, it's a special peek uh, to you. Thank you. Thank Go you ahead. so much, Pei. Well, in continuation to what uh, Michael mentioned and Nishant said, we definitely want status quo to change. And, and with that, uh, I wanted to say that the same principle guides a whole lot of our other work. And we couldn't use this uh, opportunity to talk about all our other work as well. So I wanted to particularly mention about the work that we are doing in the space of water quality monitoring and the water pollution and, and to address the issue of uh, translating research and making it available to different stakeholders in a more customized, in a more user-friendly uh, manner. So uh, this work on water pollution has been guided by the work of Professor Suprate Guha, who has pioneered uh, this piece of work in, in the entire university and globally. In India, particularly, it's a path-breaking work. And, uh, and as an extension to that, what we have attempted to do is to, again, look at the static data, which is uh, from the government sources, from other sources, which is mon about monitoring the water quality and making it available uh, to users in a way which they can actually uh, use it in, our, in their day-to-day life. So uh, along with the academic uh, orientation of the data, along with the requirement of researchers, it is, it is being customized to meet the requirements of policymakers, regulators, common people who will be using that data to make lifestyle decisions or, or livelihood decisions uh, so we are in the process of uh, okay. making this data available to people uh, through a dashboard, uh, which is going to be launched very, very soon. But I just have a snapshot of that website, uh, which I wanted to present uh, before you. Oh, it's 
time ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is uh, you can name any water body in, uh, in the atmosphere. And then zoom in and find out very detailed uh, readings. Again, moving away, just as we did from air pollution, away from <coughs> things like parts per million to whether or not it's drinkable, whether or not uh, you can uh, bathe in it. The technical measures are also there. Uh, and this is, would be the first time that people would ever have uh, access to this information in any way beyond in some super dusty book <laughs> that the Central Pollution Control Board has put out, uh, <laughs> which is unavailable in any location. Uh, and in many senses, it's, it's emblematic of what we're trying to do with DCD. And it was really all, I don't know if Sid Speaker's here. I saw him earlier. OK, he stepped out for a minute. He's embarrassed of what he's done. But <laughs> uh, it's really set off by his uh, tremendous work. And it will use <laughs> the stuff up. No, I <laughs> no, no, no. And it will you rely on. Uh, Government measurements, uh, measurements uh, <coughs> that Super Teak's team is doing, and uh, other sources. Other sources. Other sources. Yeah. First time ever. You know, uh, this is amazing because as a journalist, and we've spent a lot of time talking about air and water quality, there's so little usable research just to be able to translate <coughs> that into can you use it to cook, can you use it to drink, can you use it to bathe, can you use it to grow vegetables. And this is path breaking for a country like India where. You know, but perhaps going forward, going our water crisis is going to be our biggest problem. So thank you for, for that amazing work. Um, I, I want to be able to start this conversation right now with the panel. We'll also open this up to uh, questions from the room in a little while. But I want to, uh, I want to start with Mr. Rastogi. Mr. Rastogi, um, we'll pick up on the point of dusty books in your, in your department. <laughs> and there is a lot of work that is done by pollution control boards. Uh, in various states. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, again, the media pulls up these boards on a regular basis for perhaps failing, but doesn't, we don't look at it enough for the work that has been done. How important, in your mind, is research like this um, in helping you do your job? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank University of Chicago. See, what happens first time I'm meeting the universities which are coming forward for you know, research based to the field level transformation. I have not seen much of the university as coming forward for that. See, f first time when I met uh, people from the University of Chicago, the perception about research, industry, and regulator, that was different. Regulator seems to be, you know, uh, idealistic situation. You are sitting uh, ideal away from the public. Yes. Industry, they are also afraid of <coughs> regulator. And researchers, journalists, they talk in their own domain. Uh, you see, a lot of things have been done in the past, and we have been continuing to do this. You see, enactment, uh, what I feel, enacting law is not sufficient. Hmm. Uh, you have to take people on the road. Uh, suppose somebody is polluting. Unless you see them, show them what pollution you are creating. The reliability of data is not there. It is not, uh, like Michael has said, transparency is not available. It is not in public domain. So what pollution control boards, especially in Jharkhan, what we are doing, we are absolutely online now. Industry data is available every 15 seconds. That is also in public domain now. So public is not able to interpret it, whether you are within permissible limits or whether you are not. This is not for the public for interpretation. This is star rating and the research what we are doing is that will help us and tell us the people that which industry stands where. Mm. If it is five star rating means they are, <coughs> this, they are more than the compliant. Yes. So public also will have a perception that you know this industry is good. Because we cannot say you cannot close the industry because development has to go side by side. Now what we have to do is, this is a five-star industry, 
Uh, this is one star industry. The our focus will be on industry which are not performing well. So, like you said, uh, we have been having a lot of battles with the journalists that air pollution is there, now water again is come up. <laughs> so, we'll have a lot of issues. Uh, but my point of view is, we have to inform people and we have to inform industry what corrective measures have to be taken. And how do how will they behave? That will depends how we communicate with them. Yes. That is also very important. So changing the role of the regulator from just someone who wraps people on the knuckles to actually offering them solutions and pushing them uh, to solve problems. That was really difficult for the regulator because your mindset is such that you regulate. Yes. And uh, I think people are changing now. Hmm. Like uh, what we have done, uh, every month we are holding stakeholder meetings. Yes. And now we are open. Sometimes, you know, regulators are <coughs> criticized uh, that you are not open. Mm. Now everything is on website. You can see your data. And now we are offering that if you are compliant, a lot of incentives will be given to the industry. Like, you know, we have mandatory inspections. We said once you are compliant, once you are five star, or it may not be even five star, once you are compliant, and your data is available on website, anybody can question your data. But when reliability is there of the data, mm. so need not to go and inspect the industry again and again. And then the pollution is contained. That's amazing. Um, I also want to bring in Dr. Nair, who's been sitting very quietly. Uh, Dr. Nair, um, yeah. again, for, for someone like you, who sees people, like I said, from across India come in um, at very late stages of treatment, where even for you, it's perhaps disheartening because there's so little that can be done at that stage. How important would it be to be able to take these ideas and take this research and make it tangible on the ground through information, through trained people who can implement? Um, can it only be done through government health programs or can the private sector play a part? I think it's a combination of uh, both government agencies as mm -hmm. well as private partners because uh, there are a lot of social awareness to be created. Uh, as I mentioned previously that we have published a paper where we saw why pe people coming presenting late uh, with oral cancers which are actually very happening in the vis most visible part of the body still pe patients are <coughs> present to us in late stage even young very young patients um, less than uh, 20 30 years they, are, they present with very advanced cancers in Tata hospital so one of the reason is the, as Nishant mentioned in his paper, uh, uh, speak, uh, that uh, majority of these patients are uh, misdiagnosed. Okay. Majority of these uh, people are misdiagnosed, either non-diagnosed, uh, they are not diagnosed as oral cancers, or mm -hmm. they are diagnosed as uh, something different. Uh, biopsy facility will not be available. Uh, proper diagnosis, yeah. non made so they are not referred to a specialist. So all these issues uh, leads to delay. So we see we see around six to seven months delay um, at the start of the disease. Probably then what the picture Nishan he's saying is T3. It's actually T1 for us. That type of lesion. It's uh, okay. I mean what he says T3 T3 means uh, it's a. Uh, American uh, AJCC <laughs> classification, the tumor size. Uh, this is actually the <laughs> beginning stage the beginning which stage we see uh, cancer in India. Uh, we see that type of patients, I'm very happy because uh, I can excise it, close it, uh, and send the patient home in a week's time. But otherwise, we need a complex uh, reconstruction, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all sort of treatment modalities, mm -hmm. cost escalates, stay, patient stay more, uh, more days in the hospital, and uh, waiting period increases. We have a waiting period of two months uh, in Tata Hospital. See that these patients come. So I'm just saying seven months delay. Maybe you are also adding two months to their uh, <coughs> misery. Mm -hmm. So till uh, from they get to treatment. So I think the uh, concept uh, Nishant uh, developed to detect cancer uh, using a more uh, uh, easier way to avoid uh, experts uh, delaying the, the uh, diagnosis, experts delaying the process. Uh, we have uh, machines using uh, low cost machines which can detect these cancers quite early and uh, that could be a great, it's a revolutionary idea. Maybe we may have to 
take it in a, if you're thinking about uh, planning for a large scale screening, uh, targeted screening uh, studies in India, uh, there was a one screening study in 2005 from RCC Trivandrum. Uh, they did uh, one whole district, they screened for oral cancers. And so only one important screening study in all of the world where it showed that targeted screening of high risk population improves survival. This mm -hmm. only study available and it's from RCC Trivandrum, it's published in 2005 in Lancet. So this, but that was screening was based on trained healthcare provider. You train people, ask, show them the pictures of oral cancer, then send them to the community, ask them to or, uh, inspect everybody's oral cavity, see whether they're really suspicious, they're referred to the hospital, and then the experts, uh, specialist treats those patients. Now we don't need a train, if you have a simple portable machine yes. uh, or an instrument, People go out in the community, quickly check the saliva, find out, send them back. So targeted screening is shown to reduce the, improves the survival, and this is a great opportunity. <coughs> uh, Professor Milstone, quick question to you. Um, obviously, what the University of Chicago has achieved with these specific projects um, is, is different, it's path-breaking, it's something that can be studied to move further. What do you think is the key here between relationships between government and researchers, government and the university, and maybe the funding and the support that's coming in from the Tata Trust? Yeah, so uh, none of this would be possible without the Tata Trust, of course. Uh, I think there's this step between uh, the research, when I write a paper for Nishant and he writes a paper for me, that's all great and we have a Ooh. club, but there's this uh, step, although I, I, I do have to renew my subscription to the American Dental <laughs> Association. Don't do it. <laughs> you don't need uh, it. But there's this step with connecting with uh, the outside world, and that is, I think it's kind of uncharted territory. Yes. Uh, and trying to find a way to communicate across the academic and practitioner uh, <coughs> boundary or uh, void, I guess, uh, I think we're just figuring that out. Uh, and so uh, the chairman has been a terrific partner and we're incredibly excited to have him. Now he described what it was like when our team showed up there. I think not every chairman of pollution control, state pollution control board would have that reaction. Some might wonder, how do I get these people out of my office? Uh, and I think it requires kind of an openness uh, on both sides to talking about things and thinking about things slightly <coughs> differently than you do when you're in your own world. Yes, uh, Ishan, ideally, where would you like to see this research? Like what impact would you like to see on the ground? And what support do you think research like this needs? So I think at a very basic level, the purpose of research is to change the world and make it a better place, maybe not for us or our generation, but at least the generations to come. You know you sound like a superhero, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <coughs> We do a lot of theoretical research in, in universities, but I think UChicago TCD, this combination is a very unique combination. So you come up with the idea, other places would be like, okay, how do we make money off this? This is the exact opposite, right? Mm -hmm. Here's money, go make it happen. And it's amazing, right? And it's happening. So what our goal is, in terms of our project, I think in general, is to detect cancers early decrease the burden of cancer that the patients and the families have so they can go back to life and live their normal life, whether that's working, taking care of their children, whatever it is. The other thing that disturbs me even more is a lot of these cancers are preventable, and I joked last night at dinner, you know, everyone had their beer and their wine, you know, those are carcinogens. <laughs> but we're doing this to each other, and we're gonna continue to do this to us. And a lot of cancers are actually preventable. Um, so there has to be more of an effort beyond what we're discussing today to, to, to wipe this out. You know, cancer would be acceptable if we all developed it at late, eight, late ages when we're 80s and 90s and would die from that. But yeah, as Sudhir mentioned, patients in their 20s, 30s are getting these types of cancers. And it's really, it's not acceptable. Mr. Rasulji, before I open this up to the, to the room, a uh, question to you. From inside of government, what challenges do you face when you want to implement research that comes to your office? See, first, uh, 
the perception of the government and regulator, they believe in implementation of laws. Yes. Uh, that is their first task also. But you know, once you come to the government with a specific project and saying these will be the impact analysis, I think nowadays government are uh, willing to accept them. And you know what happened in our case also, when we realize this is not a time that you can you can't only use a stick, you can't only use a stick to regulate. Uh, then research comes because, uh, like you know, we have a, now we had a regime of uh, uh, environmental compensation. Now we have started imposing environmental compensation on different companies those who are violating. But what is the impact? how industry behaves, how a polluter behaves, if that is known to us through research, I think that will be more acceptable to us. Government will see that this is the impact, and this is the way, you know, only punitive measures that you send somebody to the prison, it's not going to work. And uh, government thinks it positively now, once the research is field-oriented for us. So we have a few minutes, and we'll open this up right now to uh, questions from the room. <coughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Very, very enlightening. Um, I'm Daffy's Mir. I'm from Erie. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is the whole issue of air pollution, particularly from rice straw burning, uh, along with colleagues here. I was very interested in the um, STAR program. Uh, but it's linked to what the um, what what, uh, what was just been said about incentives and understanding incentives. If you have a uh, system whereby essentially name and shame, mm -hmm. how do you then translate that into changing behaviour to get the impact? One of the issues in uh, uh, what we're facing in in Delhi is that. Everyone knows what the issue is. Everyone knows what the problem is. What we don't know is getting the right incentives to change the behavior. <coughs> How do we do that? Yeah, so uh, I think, terrific. The STAR rating program aims to do exactly that. Uh, <coughs> and it aims to provide incentives for firms to become five star as opposed to one star. Uh, and in truth, uh, we're in Maharashtra, we don't have enough samples for a statistically significant result yet, uh, but I, I think in about six months we will, and then we'll have a sense of whether or not this public uh, disclosure program ins provided enough incentives for firms to clean up uh, effectively. So that's one aim, but there are plenty of other ways one could do that. Uh, we're working with the state of Gujarat, which is also a TCD project, uh, and have a cap and trade program for particulates emissions. Uh, and that has now been running for a while and has very uh, exciting results, seems to be reducing emissions and reducing industry compliance costs uh, quite a bit. That's a, that kind of market mechanism is a surefire way to provide an incentive uh, for people to reduce emissions. And there's several other projects that we have ongoing. And of course, the regulators have a wide variety of their own tools uh, available as well. Yeah. Mr. Vistoli? Yeah, I'll read. Uh, see what you said, you know, uh, incentivizing industry or a polluter, <coughs> once you are compliant, we do not have any mechanisms to incentivize them. Uh, now what we are doing is, we have announced in our, uh, like in Jharkhand, what we have done is, if you are compliant industry, need not to come to the pollution control board, and then you <coughs> get your renewals because there are certain mandatory requirements to run industry under air and water act. So need not to come to the pollution control, directly from our website you can do that. So the impact was the moment we announced, what has happened is, industry started regulating themselves. Mm. Now their data is visible on our website, it is visible to the public also. Now there's a pressure on them from the civil society that you are not complying the norms. So the change is not going to come in a day. It will take some time, but uh, we have started the journey. I think I am hopeful that we will be able to achieve our targets very soon. 
Second, this, you know, be, well, like you said, you know, the behavior, how to change the people's behavior. Pollution doesn't come only from the industry. There are many more causes, many more uh, pollutants, those who are creating that uh, pollution. We have to create <coughs> awareness, like for single-use plastic, we did a lot of awareness. And it creates a lot of impact on environment and human health also. But we have to tell people, you know, it's very easy to say that you phase out single-use plastic. But it's very difficult to do that. And you have to tell people, you have to I, tell I, them. I just want to um, ask you, when it comes to crop burning or firecrackers or single-use yeah. plastic, there's no industry per se to sort of name and shame. Yeah. Is banning the best way to do it? Uh, just take uh, it off the market, just make it contraband? Is that the uh, best way to do it? See, uh, this is my personal experience. A lot of research is there. The moment you ban, a lot of illegal trade happens. So it is, you have, there are, Government of India has enacted extended producer responsibility. Those who produce it, they have to recollect and reuse. What we have done in case of Jharkhand, I am, because I yes. am well aware about my state, uh, last about 20 days what we have done, we have collected the plastic and it was taken to ACC clinker plant, where it can be used as an alternative fuel. Mm. Because all of a sudden you cannot ban anything unless you create an alternative. Yes. And second, you know, a lot of employment is there. So create a mechanism to regulate, create a mechanism to reduce and recycle. That is the only option. And provide them alternative. Overnight, if you say it is banned, I don't think that uh, people know a lot of contraband items are there and they are easily available. So why do you want to go to, into that regime? So we said uh, rather you reuse, recycle, and you know, that provides a lot of, but that is also a natural resource. Petrochemicals are there. Yes. Then that can put to another better use. And we are working on it. Gentlemen in the third row. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for sharing your views. Um, I was wondering, are there any plans to engage with our hardworking central government as well? Because some of this pollution tends to cut across state lines, as we're seeing in Delhi right now, uh, while students create the Jharkhand and other progressive states are, are employing this. But what about industries where the pollution can happen downstream? Um, you know, I don't think Delhi is necessarily polluted just because of the pollution being generated here, but it's coming in from state lines. So is there any, are there any plans to engage? Yeah, no, there's a, a lot of the work we do, uh, the MOEFCC or the CPCB plays uh, an important role in, uh, and indeed later today I will be going to the MOEF and talking to them about some of the programs we're doing uh, and ways to get them to be used across multiple states. But I, I think the chairman will have a much better You have our best wishes in leadership. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> uh, I think I'll be happy to announce that uh, now government of India is also thinking that you should star, you should star rating your industry. It's not uh, that it's star rating, but they say like Ministry of Mines and Ministry of Coal. What they are doing, they have created their internal uh, assessment of which, industry, which mine is less polluting, which industry is less polluting. Maybe, you know, similar kind of a rating program, Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Mines, and <laughs> MOEF. Uh, we are working on it. <laughs> Should we give a round of applause to the Pollution yeah. Control Board of Jalkin? Uh, Any questions for the doctors? I'd I like to make one more. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, like Lenny has made presentation regarding water bodies uh, in India. I think my request to uh, your center would be like a lot of water bodies are inside forest because I deal with forest and environment also in my state. Uh, we have done a lot of studies. Water body in inside forest, they are much better off. Their BOD level is less. They are, you can simply drink that water without, only by filtration. Mm. So my request would be that you can carry out a research with the water bodies available because I know a lot about in uh, US. Uh, but in India, I think we could not do much about it, but water bodies which are inside forests, <coughs> that water quality, vis vis water quality outside, what could be? So that will also help. No, because lot of water bodies are there, that water can be utilized for botanic purposes. So I think uh, that can also be taken up in your project. Ready? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yes, From if I office. may, I'd like to give an opportunity to the young ladies. We haven't had a woman ask a question yet. Um, hi. So something I really liked about this panel was that uh, we talked a lot about how important it is to translate academic research into data that someone can make a decision about. Um, and it got me thinking about how we could do the same or what tools could be built to do the same for the public policy making process itself. For example, I've had all the privileges of education and I barely understand how public policy gets made. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I work for the water to cloud team. And uh, you know we have a lot of data, and the analysis part is what's easier for us. But what's harder is figuring out which ministry or which tribunal passed what order when, and what the archives of that look like. So I'm wondering if you guys have ideas about how, um, what tools we can build to make public policy itself a more understandable process so that individuals can better interact with it. Of course, if the lack of understanding of public policy might be because it's unscientific in many cases. But um, and it, it's convoluted, right? There's yes. a lot of decision makers, a lot of stakeholders, and that's not archived anywhere. That's not um, people are not making tools so that you can make decisions about. Yes. That. In fact, um, anyone from the panel who wants to take this, I know that the, within the legal community, there's a lot of online digital digitization that's happening of laws of judgments. <coughs> of previous observations that were made so people can now access uh, you know, judgments from across our, uh, our, our country. Should we have the same thing from the government side, from policies? So, so uh, yes. most of the laws, before they make pass in the parliament, after the, the cabinet approves, that is presented in the website. Yes. They ask for public comments. Yes. And only few people come and know. Only few people know that yes. there's such a thing exists. It's already yes. put in the website. So maybe we have to be a little more proactive go to the website, download the laws, maybe spend some time, go through the hundreds of <laughs> uh, sections, subsections, yeah. and yes. uh, you uh, can also comment on A this. lot of times these things are put up for public comment and feedback in, like you said, very difficult ways to understand. And the public feedback is rarely taken on board. So that's So I think that is where uh, NGOs can chip in and they can make it a little more palatable for the public. Highlights important aspects of these things. Uh, yeah, there's this is it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think it's related. Uh, there are two features of uh, the American political policy making system that I think that I wish I saw, and uh, there's some that I wish I didn't see in other countries, but these are two that I wish I would see in other uh, in other countries, including India. The first is the Congressional Budget Office, uh, and the Congressional Budget Office uh, has as their mandate to do budget scoring of bills uh, and to make you know, assessments of what the impacts on the budget and the economy will be uh, of various uh, different legislative proposals. And when you go back in time before there was a Congressional <coughs> Budget Office, <coughs> the quality of the debate about bills uh, was much worse because basically nobody had any information. The only information that was available came from the President's team uh, and so Congress didn't have an independent voice, or didn't have any independent analysis. So that is an extraordinarily useful institution. A related one is, uh, it has one of the world's worst names, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. Uh, and it basically conducts the same style of thing for regulation. Now, that only exists inside the White House, and so there isn't an independent one from Congress. But it kind of spreads sunshine uh, around so that there's information. And then when they ask for public comment, there is much more information available to the public to base their comments on. I think uh, more powerful than public policy is to change individual behavior. Um, regardless of the public comments on policy, I think it's not as useful as if you actually change individual behavior. So if we all decide that we're not going to drink water out of a plastic bottle, mm -hmm. and if anyone here has that and we say, why are you doing this? This is a great achievement. And I don't need to pass a, a law for this. So I think it's very hard, that's a challenge, so it's a change in individual behavior, but I think that's the grassroots efforts that we can make. Mr. Sophie, yeah. is there a need for a better understanding of how our government structures work? Because in India, unfortunately, unlike in other parts of the world, people only see the minister or the state government. The actual structure that 
that's behind every ministry, how the laws get made, there isn't too much that's understood or uh, known about mm. that. Should we uh, remedy that? I think, you know, that, that is available on the website. Mm. What, uh, what he has said is, whenever, because I have been a party to for many bits laid in the state legislature, and my feeling is that a lot of people, they do not come forward, they, no, nobody reads those. It is all, most of the time it is available in the website. Mm. And we hardly get public comments. So either we have to be more open in the public, uh, because website it is there, and we hardly receive any comment. Second, what could be that if you have a list, if you propose something, in India you have a provision to introduce even a private bill that can also be placed in the parliament. Yes. That is also possible. And structure, it is available on every ministry's website, what administrative structure you have, and how the law is passed, it is also available on the website. But it is not, uh, people may not able to understand how it government works. Yes. Uh, that could be, uh, because I am being a part of the government, because I don't feel that. But from other side, people may feel otherwise. In fact, um, I want to give you an example. When uh, the city of Mumbai decided to cut down 3,500 trees in an island that can barely afford that, uh, there were public comments that were yeah. invited. They got 80,000 objections from citizens, and they ignored every last one of them. And they went ahead and cut those trees anyway. Um, as a citizen, that, that's very disheartening to, you know, to have actually, I, I don't think, I think the steel flyover in Bangalore was another example where citizens came together. But this was an amazing example of citizens who came, literally showed up in the middle of the night and said, we will not allow you to cut our trees. And the trees got cut nevertheless. So maybe there has to be, while I completely agree citizens have to be more active the government has to be more receptive to what yeah, citizens that, want. That is true. That is because the uh, because I also read in the newspaper regarding that incident. I have also just <laughs> being a forester. Basically, I am a forest officer, so I was also moved by by that. I think we, uh, uh, what is happening is we have to create a balance uh, between two. And I don't know what was the situation in Mumbai. Why did why they were forced to take a call on it. Uh, but uh, you know, sometime I have seen in many places, uh, government uh, do succumb to that and they do consider. Like if you do it in Kolkata in West Bengal, I am, because it's very close by. And whenever there is a, you know, people cry for the uh, trees, yes. and government in most of the cases has avoided <coughs> cutting trees. Well, um, I could tell you what went on behind the scenes, but we only yes. have five minutes. Uh, yes, I'll just very quickly, very quickly. Yes, please. Uh, again, uh, a question on the five-star rating, as well as you know, a uh, spin-off on what you you suggested or, or spoke about. Uh, you know, a lot is being done about you know saying that you are a five-star or a four or a three, and you know awards, etc. But is the government or any other body trying to assist people who are ones and twos to you know, reach the five-star level or a four-star level? Uh, is any such program being organized or any <coughs> initiative in that regard? Yeah, basic idea of five-star rating is not only to tell people that you are a five-star. See, uh, what data you get, you know, there are three stages, what Michael has said. One is quantity of data, second is quality of data, and then how you, uh, from quantity to quality, how do we migrate? Basically, that is a five-star rating. Because if you tell industry that you are, you are not five-star, you are zero-star, that is not going to work. We have to help industry that from zero, how do you move to five-star? That is actually the five-star rating program. It's not that we only rate you that you are minus a star or zero-star or you are one-star. We will tell that calibration, your installation of devices is wrong, what measures you can take. And, uh, otherwise, you know, simply rating industry that you are bad and you are good is not going to serve any purpose. Idea is to help them. And that is the five-star rating program is. Um, I believe we've run out of time. Uh, uh, gentlemen of the panel, thank you so much, not just for giving us your time, but also for the work that each of you are doing uh, quietly behind the scenes, but you are saving the world for all of us. Um, I do believe that this is the path going forward when research and time spent in labs and in universities 
actually aids government and aids public policy. And um, I suppose the media and the rest of us need to find ways to offer more support in terms of <coughs> passing the information around, getting more citizens to become active, getting more parts of private industry perhaps to also support what's going on uh, in these rooms. So thank you so much. Thank you.